Hey guys, welcome to TYT Sports. Ben Mankiewicz, Jason Rubin. That's Scooter Jeanette, second baseman for the Milwaukee Brewers. Scooter, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, uh, first of all, congratulations. I understand you're out, uh, you're in California. You've obviously been here because you come out here to play, and I'm sure you were here growing up as well, I imagine. But uh, but you're with your fiance. It's her first trip to California. Yes. yes. Nice. Is she enjoying it? She's very excited. We went to Sir last night, which is her favorite restaurant now. Um, All right, good, good. Never been there. Been living here 14 years. Don't even really know what you're talking about. Well, Fantastic. It's a, it's a big I'm TV very, show. I'm very <laughs> hip. I am very, very <laughs> hip. I'm on the cut. So, um, you grew. You know, you're a, a. You've you've been up in the bigs for about a year and a half, mm -hmm. uh, and you're now the Ricky Weeks is going to leave Milwaukee. You're the Brewers second baseman. I mean, you were the primary second baseman last year, but this is it now. You're you're the guy. That's got to feel. It's got to feel pretty good. I mean, you're tw I can't. You know, you're 24 years old, and so like nine years ago, you're 15. Did you think there was a possibility that in 2015 you'd be heading to spring training as the undisputed starter on a big league club? You know, that's that's tough to say. Um, growing up, you you always dream. You always think about what the big leagues would be like and uh, making it there. But it becoming reality is different. L um, let me let me ask it better. Like so. When is the moment when you think, oh, I'm not just the best player among my friends? Like, <laughs> I, I think I'm actually quite good at this. It's a good question. Um, I was actually that kid. I was undersized for the most part. I uh, smallest guy on the team. Actually, played a little basketball and football. Mm -hmm. Led the team in rebounds one year I played. Oh, so you're you're fierce. You're yeah, a competitor. You know, All right, throwing bows. Um, yeah. <laughs> but no, it was um, for me at 15. It's kind of hard to. You know, when you're that young, it's hard to really look down the road and where your life's going to be. But I always felt like I was going to make it because yeah. I always put that, that work in. And um, I would say until high school, my junior year, I was probably, that's when I was. It like, started to occur to you that, hey, something's happening here. Yeah, you <laughs> right? know, I'm pretty good. Hey, these high school pitchers, they can't, they don't, they can't get me out. No. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, like uh, many of us who grew up, and I, you know, uh, I, I knew very early on that, uh, that my path, to the uh, big leagues was going to be as a broadcaster. And I considered it really seriously. That's what I wanted to do more than anything was be a baseball broadcaster. But I don't have, like you said, you're the leading rebounder when you played basketball. Like, I don't have the commitment. I did not have the, you know, I did it for a while. I'd take the micro, I'd take the tape recorder, I'd go up, I'd sit in the bleachers at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, sit in the upper deck, I mean, at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore. And I'd do the game, but I did it five times. And then I thought, eh, I just want to hang out with my friends. And I thought, do I want to spend, a year in Yakima and a year in the Sally League and a year in Bakersfield. And I thought, no, I don't have that in me. I didn't have that drive, right. which is almost the thing I admire most about athletes. And I think it gets overlooked because there's a lot of talk about natural talent, right? Mm -hmm. But this is, you gave up weekends. You gave up, you were, I assume you were on serious travel teams, right? Like baseball was, took over your life, I imagine, yeah, from was... age 12 to until you got drafted. It was a whole nine. Um, my dad actually asked me when I was eight or nine. Uh, he's like, how serious are you about baseball? And I'm like, I love it. And mm -hmm. I'm eight. <laughs> right. I, love, yeah. I, love I loved it at eight, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, we'll move to Florida. And Oh, so they moved to Florida for you, in a partly. Um, they didn't break the news to my sister like that. Uh, <laughs> how old was your sister? She older? She was, she was 12 at the time. Oh. So it was a tough time for her to you know, yeah. leave all her friends. She and was stuff. pissed. But yeah. my dad was a scout for the Astros before I was born. Oh. So he realized in the northern areas it's just tough to, you know, to Right, you to make in Cincinnati. Right. right, out of Ohio. You're not able to play all year round. You only get maybe two solid months out of the year. So moving down to Florida, that's when it really... Uh, blew up for me, 100, 120 games a year, you know, practice Jeez. every day you weren't playing. I, we actually lived in St. Petersburg, which is about 45 minutes away from Tant or from Sarasota, and we would drive back and forth every single day. I've so. spent uh, every spring from age 10 to almost age 20 in St. Petersburg for at least a week. We'd go for spring training. We'd go see the Cardinals. My dad was a Cardinal fan. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's impressive. Now, and you also then, you grew up, a uh, you were a fan of baseball movies. Absolutely. Yeah, so was I. And there are a lot of really, let's be honest, there are a lot of really bad ones, right? Like, it's hard to get, it's mm -hmm. hard to get it right. 
because it's a refined skill. There's a refi anytime you're showing a refined skill in a movie, it's difficult right. to do. And there's a lot of goofiness around it. And uh, but you uh, you're a big Sandlot fan. I am. Like how many times have you seen the Sandlot? I don't even know. Um, one year I watched it. Every night before I went to bed. <laughs> so, uh, so we're so at least three hundred times. Right. So we're past <laughs> ten. Times. We're into we're into double digits. We're into triple digits. Jason, you're a fan Sandlot fan. I'm a big Sandlot fan. It was actually one of my favorite baseball movies growing up too. I don't know if I've watched it three hundred times. Yeah. But are you at the level of watching the Sandlot where you could basically quote the entire movie? <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, I'm the type of person though where I might say I know a song and. You know, it'll be like, we'll sing it, and I can't. But once the beat comes on, it'll right, click. Right. But here's the, here's the thing. See, I'm, I'm 47 years old. So in 1993, I was, uh, I was 26 years old. I was a grown man. I was having sex, okay? Right? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't go have. Thanks for that. <laughs> right. So, like, like, I keep meeting these young uh, 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 baseball players or fans, and The Sandlot is their sort of seminal movie of their childhood. And I was like, it was a kid's movie, right? Yeah. So I missed it. I mean, I, I've seen it, but it didn't, it had no mm -hmm. resonance with me. Right. But you, like, well, first of all, we got a little Sandlot clip, so let's take a look. We'll come right back. I know you're smart, and I'm proud of you. I want you to make some friends this summer. Meet Scotty Smalls. Kale, get it! <laughs> the kid is a L7 weenie. My life is over. Man, this is baseball. You gotta stop thinking. You just have fun. Climb trees, hop fences, get into trouble. Just stand there and stick your glove out in the air. I'll take care of it. Now he's in. Yeah! All right! With the coolest guys in the neighborhood. They've got the look. Wendy Peppercorn. Wow. Hey, girls. They've got the moves. <laughs> They've got the rap. Block it! Geek, jerk, idiot, moron. You bump for apples in the toilet, and you like it. You play ball like a girl. Yeah. I got it, I got it, I got it. Oh, no. <laughs> but something else has got their ball. That wasn't my ball. Dad's father gave it to him. Babe Ruth signed that ball. Babe Ruth! We gotta get that ball back. You got any bright ideas? Initiate retrieval section number one. Power connect. Come on, help me, it's heavy. Now. Century Fox presents. Hey guys, it's the Sandlot Babies. You're the ones that making all that racket. A lifetime of adventure. Come on, Squeeze, you can do it. Go through, bud. Little bird. Who's your favorite Sandlot character? Probably Porter. You're nodding like that's a solid pick. It's a solid pick. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I like Smalls. Smalls. Just for the like, just for the line, you're killing me, Smalls. But like at the same time, I've seen that come up so much outside of just even baseball and baseball yeah. movies. It's just an everyday life thing. Right. Now that like I've just friends all the time, you're killing me, Smalls. Yeah. It's, and you need Smalls to be there for that line to happen. Absolutely. Since we're all now grown ups, I mean barely over here. <laughs> um, uh, what other uh, what other baseball movies sort of have resonated? with? Uh, we got Bill Durham. Yeah, of course. Um, I think Kevin Costner does a good job, at least with looking like a baseball player. I thought from a baseball point of view, yeah, totally. He definitely, uh, you know, I thought he played at Fullerton, but he didn't. He wa tried to walk on and he got cut. I think he wasn't good enough. He played right. in high school. But every year that they go to the College World Series in Omaha, he goes. Mm -hmm. um, and they go a lot. Uh, but um, uh, I thought the perfect game, did you see the perfect game? From a, it's a silly movie, but from the baseball stuff in it is, is really good. Is that a more 12, 13 age group? Is it like a? <laughs> it's a little. It's a little. It's gonna be. A, it's gonna be a grown up. It's like a romance. It's a romance for crying out loud. Okay, you apparently haven't seen the perfect game. It's good. The base and they get Vin Scully to do the play by play. Really? He's the Tigers mm. broadcaster. So like the. I have to see it. Yeah, the stuff is. It's Costner and uh, and. It's on uh, Netflix. Yeah, it's probably on Netflix. It's be it was not. 
Cher- was not it was not list. cherished by America. Uh, but uh, well, I now, stole her account. So no. I got it. Uh, I love it. You're like a professional baseball player stealing her Netflix account. So, uh, the uh, 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 Field of Dreams. Mm-hmm. Great movie. You got to watch the movie a couple times to really get it. Um, but that's got a couple of different angles. That's more for an older group. I liked it. I was intrigued just because of all the um, old school players and the old school look. I actually got a chance to meet Kevin Costner's father in the movie. Oh, right, the guy who played his dad. Right, and put on his put on mm-hmm. the same glove and stuff. And that guy's not a ball player. No, but he was able to catch the ball with that he glove. He could catch, which but he couldn't. Re- he couldn't really throw. Like this, you know, when they have the catch, there's a little bit of yeah, there's a little, <laughs> a little, bit, there's a little bit of that going on there's with the dad. A, there's a little doesn't matter. You're crying bit, yeah. at that. So let me tell you a quick story about that movie. So I've told the story before, but it's a good. One. So uh, I see that movie uh, uh, when it came out, and uh, so I think '89, and I'm 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 a senior in college, and I'm over the summer I'm with my uh, I'm out in San Francisco with my uh, girlfriend and her family. And I see the movie with her, and my dad and I were incredibly close, and really, baseball was a unifying force for us. He, serious baseball fan, made me a serious baseball fan, like I said, spring training every year. We, and so I see the movie, and it's about fathers and sons, and I, of course, cry. I cry easily, right? <laughs> I call my dad. I get back to her house. I call my dad. I'm like, well, he's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, well, dad, listen, I just... Uh, I just saw Field of Dreams, and I and he goes, ah, I saw it last night. What a load of crap, right? <laughs> if they, <laughs> if you build it, they, well, who, what is that? Just such nonsense. And of course, I'm like, totally ridiculous, <laughs> horrible piece of crap. Yeah, so that was a nice little father-son moment there. And then later, he now he went into revisionist history about that story. He was like, no, I was incredibly moved by that movie. <laughs> no, I... Uh, I remember that well. All right, let's talk a little, a little quickly about the about the Brewers. Um, yeah, the winter meetings are done, but that was the most intense four days as a baseball fan I can remember for for deals being made. Uh, you guys were largely set that out. We did. Uh, I think going in, they said that they weren't really yeah. going to mess with a whole lot. But I think we, I mean, at least with the uh, Rule Five guys, and I don't know if that has to. Do with all the winter meetings and stuff, but we made, we made a few moves. Yeah. Um, but all in all, I think that we pretty much have our team set. Uh, obviously, with the pickup from Lind, uh, that's going to be huge for middle of our lineup with a you know another left-handed bat uh, is always good. But um, I think we're just eager to go to spring and you guys start were, like we did last year. You guys led, you know, what, through July, really. You guys were in first place most of the year. So how does that, uh, w- how long does the sort of uh, sour taste of a season that sort of spun a little bit out of control with it? I was, I'm an, as a an, as an lifelong Oakland A's fan, I can identify with the spiraling out of control in the last couple of months. But uh, does that stay with you or do you turn the page pretty quickly? Um, you want to turn the page, but but it does stay with you. You know, when, when you're that far ahead, when, you know, you're almost dominating, in a sense, uh, of the game at a time. Uh, I think we were 15 games ahead, and uh, to have that fall, that spiral effect that you were talking about was, was tough. It was tough on me individually, uh, our team, the organization, uh, but we realized how good we are. Um, but we also realized that we have to just go out and have fun and not worry about things, and that was, I think, most of our troubles was once we started losing, it was, why are we losing? We try to fix everything. It's like, let's just go out and play and have fun. Let me ask you one more question in this regard, because I, I, do, I, do, I do my, I have a movie show, too, and whenever I have a director on or an actor on, and I try it to, in a way that isn't, you know, insulting, but what I, I'm really interested in how people cope with failure. I've always been interested in it. My own failures have been, at times, difficult for me to deal with. And people in the public eye, athletes, creative people, people who make movies, their failures are often public. You know, you make a movie, you spend a lot of money on it, critics hate it, doesn't make any money. You know, people are essentially, not directly, but they're, they're pointing fingers at you. Right. And, and your failures are incredibly public. The team mm-hmm. falls apart. Uh, you know, you had a really nice year, especially at, at your age. You know, you can obviously be proud of your year, but how do you handle public failure and what, and then, be able to turn it around when you have to produce when you fail Wednesday and you got to produce Thursday. Right, that's a that's a great question. Um, it's very tough to do. The best to do it, 
Uh, you look at guys like, like Derek Jeter, all those, all those guys, they have the mental part of the game, you know, and they always have. Uh, it's, it's going out consistently with the, the same attitude and, and drive. You know, you really can't, at least in baseball, control even after you hit the ball. You don't know if it's going to get caught or, you know, someone's going to mess up. So it's out of our control, but when you do fail over a longer period of time, you know, in the public eye, you know, at any time anybody could check how I did. I make an air in front of 30,000 people, they're all booing me. It makes you, it and doesn't you, make you feel good. And you come of age in the era of, of Twitter where the reaction that players can get is, is instantaneous now. Mm -hmm. If you sit down and watch the Sandlot, go back to your roots, probably go out the next day. Clear mind, right? Exactly, exactly. I, uh, I used it to just feel comfortable to go to sleep. You know, you have nightmares when you're little. I would, it was something that made me feel good. Yeah. So yeah, next time I'm 0 for 4 or 4 Ks, I'll watch that game. <laughs> the, uh, so like, here's my, I have a theory, and, and this is the part that might be awkward. Like, I've covered basketball, I've covered football, and, and, and there, are good there are athletes who are great to talk to and athletes who aren't. Baseball players in general, I found, can be the most difficult. <laughs> part of it's the daily grind of the season. I think you're out there constantly, you know, football mm -hmm. players don't have to deal with the media quite as much. But I think it's the manner in which they have to deal with failure that breeds a sort of, you want me to engage with the press after the game, and I, I, I you know, I, look, even if I got a knock, even if I went one for four, man, I struck out twice. I didn't drive that guy in from third with less than right. two outs. I didn't move the runner over from second. Yeah, I made that play, but I didn't get the ball to my glove. You didn't turn the double play quickly enough, and that led to a run. And even though it doesn't show up, it might look like you did okay. Right. That stuff's eating at you. And not only do you, and somehow you have to process that and turn around and come in the next day completely clean. And I think that leads to what is perceived by, I think, some in the media, but also fans, as some sullenness from baseball players. You know, like you guys aren't the most, in general, you know, the passion shown on the bench is less than in other sports. I think you'd probably agree with that. And I'm wondering if that's at all part of it, or if it's just the way the culture is built up in baseball over the years. I think it's where you're watching the baseball. You, know, you go to Latin America and watch games. It's, it's very exciting. It's almost that basketball intensity. Oh, is that right? It, it yeah. is, and, and that's why you see guys like Gomez on our team. He hits a home run, and the bat's out of his hand right when he hits the ball, and he's, <laughs> yeah. you know, pimps it or whatever you want to call it, and, and it sprints lot, around the bases. I know, and a lot of old school guys uh, can't stand that. I, I think I, I love it. I love that he cares. I love guys who care. I love guys who try and break mm -hmm. their bats. I love guys who get frustrated. I because I know I would. I'm with you. Yeah. There's something respectable but, about the intensity of, of certain players, and when they bring that to the field, it just makes it more exciting to watch, right. uh, especially things like that flip of the week that was coming out on a regular <laughs> basis. <laughs> All right, uh, Scooter, thank you. Appreciate it, man. Oh, thanks, thanks for being for here. Guys. It was fun. Good to meet you. Good, Good to meet talk you. to you. Thank you. Jason, thanks. Of course. All right.